must be. More mile. Oh, that's a little bit better now. Everybody better? here, can you in the back yeah. hear okay? Okay, good. Okay, calling this third quarterly membership meeting to order. Um, we have a quorum. I stopped at 40, so I know it was 30 is the quorum, so I think we have 50, 60 people or so, so thanks for coming. Um, I want to first of all start, and you have in your papers that you picked up when you came in, um, our agenda and the items to look at. And, and first, we've got 12 folks that we lost in this third quarter. And I want to just take a moment of remembrance. So if you will look at their names and we will enter into a period of silence. Yeah. Okay. The next item on our agenda is um, recognition of guests, and we have two board members that I know of that are here, Diane Williams. There's Diane. Let's give her a welcome.
first three quarters of 2022. After looking at these, and I know you haven't had a lot of time, can I answer any questions? For the new members, if you're familiar with looking at balance sheets, you see a liability. Liabilities usually mean we owe money. That's not what there are on our balance sheet. The three liabilities that are listed are the Writer's Journal, the Library Fund, and our Residence Appreciation Fund. Those are restricted funds, meaning I can't spend that money, the Executive Committee cannot spend that money except on these items. Now, they're having to show here because QuickBooks which is our accounting system, that's the only way they will let me report restricted funds. Make sense? Yes, Bill. Sharon, I've uh, probably heard and forgotten, but what is the Texas Culture Change Coalition uh, for $6,000? In 2021, the Executive Committee <coughs> voted to make donations to certain different charities and or associations. This particular Texas Cultural Change Coalition, it was voted on to give them $6,000. We had to wait until I could cash in a CD in 2022 to pay them, to give them that money. As it turns out, Chuck is the chairman of that coalition. Am I right, Chuck? Oh, that's great. So I have a presentation and a little bit about it. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Is there a motion to accept? Second. Julie Brooks and Bill Schleich seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion passes. So we are now moving to have as much time as possible for the executive director's report and the other presentations, including the RAF and the, and the journal, the writer's journal. So Chuck. Thank you very much. I'm going to do things a little differently today and I want to skip ahead to um, something I want to do and I barely get a chance to do this. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a celebration today. And a lot of it has to do with our resident satisfaction survey. Um, the leadership team you may have noticed is in the back of the room as you came in. Let's give them all a big hand for all they did. Just recently, we received five-star Sinside Resident Satisfaction Award based on your satisfaction surveys that you completed. Um, we had 89% participation, which is unheard of. The industry average is around 64%. Um, we received a 93% overall. 96% would recommend Westminster, which is 12 points above the industry average. 97% satisfaction with our handling of the pandemic, which is something I'm very proud of. Um, recently, you may have seen the article on Ruth Sunil, Extraordinary Women and Austin American Statesman. Also, the, in the newsletter was an article about Sarah Lloyd being named an Austin Women in Business Showcase participant. And we also received recently, it's not me. <laughs> We also received the uh, Silver Safety Award from LCS and they give $2,000 to our community for safety programming. Um, and because of our work comp claims being so low, we also received in Sa San Antonio, the marketing team went down there to the LCS um, conference and received awards for 95% occupancy and in independent living and healthcare center during a pandemic. That's also pretty cool. 
So today I have some outstanding resident satisfaction survey awards to give out. And I'm going to start with all of the departments that have scored 95% or better. Community Life Services outstanding resident satisfaction of 95%. Bruce Sunil. So Ruth is out sick and we'll give her award at his future check. Sales and marketing, as I name your award, if you'll come up and pick them up right here on this table, just like at the LCS conference. Our sales and marketing outstanding resident satisfaction, 96%. Congratulations, Jordan. <laughs> the Arbor Healthcare Center outstanding resident satisfaction, 96%. Cassie Mailer. <laughs> Accounting, outstanding resident satisfaction. All that billing's done such a great job in paying those bills. 97%, Sarah Lloyd. Security and Transportation, Outstanding Resident Satisfaction, 98%. Okay, so he's doing rounds, keeping us secure. Right? Resident Health Services, Outstanding Resident Satisfaction, Robin Akins. Reception, outstanding resident satisfaction, 99%. Wow, 99%. Olga Villarreal. <laughs> and Sarah, I couldn't stand that you weren't getting some kind of award, so. Austin Business Journal's 2022 Central Texas Women in Business Showcase Award, Sarah Lloyd. And can you believe that they did that article, that fantastic article on Ruth, and she doesn't get an award either, I had to give her an award. So. Austin American States, the 2022 Women in Thank you all, leadership team. You can go back to work now. I appreciate you. <laughs> Thanks for all you do. Let's give one big hand on the <laughs> So this presentation today, uh, last presentation was all about finance, right? And how we're financially secure. So today's presentation, I want to talk about quality, right? Um, I want to also thank you all for support, supporting our fundraising for Alzheimer's Texas. We raised $115,772 today. This is our best ever. Thank you so much. So let's talk quality for a minute. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Good. Um, one of the programs, I think there's several things that sets Westminster apart from everybody else, but one of the most important things is a program called CARES. And it's centered around resident powered services. And it's really about being resident centered. Westminster itself, our assisted living and our harbor at Westminster are all, are all places that residents call home. A home is where someone lives and is nurtured, their human spirit as well as their medical needs. Culture change is a movement to promote person-centered care. It's a model of, of care that we have employed here at Westminster for many years. This is what the Texas Culture Change Coalition is all about. The goal is to deinstitutionalize the facility to create an environment that follows the residents' routines rather than those imposed by the facility and provides truly individualized care. So we listen to you. Um, instead of, if you go into our healthcare center or to our assisted living, we're going to ask you, what are your lifelong patterns like? 
when do you like to take your medications? When do you like to bathe? How do you, when do you want to wake up? When do you want to go to sleep? We're not going to tell you when you need to go to sleep, when you need to wake up, when you need to take your medicine, when you need to eat breakfast. All of those things we negotiate with you. We started CARES here at Westminster back in 2008. The previous year, 2007, we had really high turnover in our healthcare center. Um, we had gotten 17 deficiencies on our state survey. We had been hotlined into the state 22 times in the previous year. So we brought this idea of resident-centered care to the healthcare center. In our first year of CARES, centered around resident power and services, we took our building from a one-star building to a four-star building in the first six months. The second six months, we went from four to five, and we've maintained five-star rating for the last 14 years. When we instituted resident-centered care in our healthcare center, we reduced agency staffing by 95%. We reduced the turnover in our staff by 44%. Re we reduced weight loss by 50% just by giving residents choice. Um, we decreased the amount of pressure ulcers that we had in the healthcare center by 88%. Wow. We decreased falls by 50%. We actually instituted what's called now consistent assignment um, where residents and staff work together on the same wings or the same uh, rooms that are assigned to the consistent person so that we get to know you we get to anticipate your needs and and by anticipating your needs it reduces falls we reduced our use of antipsychotic and psychotropic medications by 83 percent wow. and we also increased our resident and staff satisfaction our staff satisfaction when i started in healthcare was around 56 percent we were nowhere near a top workplace. What's going on almost 15 years later? We've been five star rated by Medicare for 14 years. We have outstanding quality indicators, lowest readmission rates to hospitals of any facility around, great rehab success rate. We've been best senior living community, independent living, assisted living, and a skilled nursing facility, that's the Arbor, for 15 years, ranked by US News and World Report. We've been a top workplace for eight years. We have high associate satisfaction and high resident satisfaction and multiple years of deficiency-free <laughs> service. What is person-centered care? It's where you focus on the needs and the care preferences of each individual. Care that values the uniqueness of the individual, maintains and or restores personal identity, keeps the person at the center of the care planning and decision-making process. Person-centered care promotes personal worth, social confidence, respect, truthfulness, independence, engagement, choice, and hope. How many of you work on resident committees here? Raise your hands high. You're driving Westminster. Your interactions, your advice to us, all of the things that you do drive Westminster. That's the very essence of being resident center. Staff learn and adapt. Staff learn to place a premium on active listening and observing, listening to the resident and what they want. Focus on each individual resident, adapts to each resident's changing needs, regardless of their abilities. So if you want to paint, we need to figure out a way to enable you to paint. If you want to listen to oldies on the radio, we need to figure out a way to do that. We are all about supporting you. Person-centered values, know each person, anticipate their needs, hopes, dreams, and goals central to their care, being included in creating their individual plan of care, choice, dignity, and respect, self-determination, purposeful living, empowerment, care centered around and driven by the person receiving the care and put the person before the task. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that's probably why I've gotten into resident-centered care and culture change. 
because I'm kind of worried that if I end up in a nursing home or assisted living, it's not going to be as nice as Westminster. <laughs> <laughs> and I may not be able to afford Westminster. And I, if, I, if I started now, I might get in. The ready list is pretty long. <laughs> but we want to create a home atmosphere. We want to have an emphasis on the relationship between the residents and the staff. How does person-centered care benefit the residents? Well, number one, it gives you autonomy and it gives you the ability to direct your own care. Choices promote engagement and improved quality of life. It also gives you the ability to live in an environment of trust and respect. I hope you all feel trusted and respected. Close relationships with staff that are attained, attuned to their changes and can respond appropriately continue to live in a way that is meaningful to them. There are benefits for the staff. We build form, we, we form strong relationships. We build strong relationships with our residents and each other. We know a person's preferences. It's much easier to give you what you want to eat as opposed to giving you what you don't want to eat. <laughs> and it's easier to give your medications to you when you want to take them than when you don't want to take them. And it's more comfortable caring for people they know in a, in a way that people want to be cared for. Staff are highly valued in person-centered care organizations. So we show our staff a lot of appreciation. That's one of the keys to our success because I believe if we have happy associates, we have happy residents. We work more efficiently in person-centered care environments and we get to discover a renewed passion for their work. There are benefits to the community. It becomes a place where everyone can continue to live and make choices. We have better quality outcomes. We gain referrals from people who have a good experience. We have better staff retention, lower turnover, and higher satisfaction scores for residents and staff. Culture change is the progression from the institutional model of care for, to more individual, person-directed practices that embrace autonomy. The vision is to create a culture of aging that is inclusive, life-affirming, satisfying, humane, and meaningful. Culture change requires changes in organizational practice, uh, physical environments, workplace practices, and relationships. It all started with this silly little cartoon back in 2008. Honey, I've been through two world wars, the Great Depression, taught 3,297 children, administered four elementary schools, and outlived every one of my pastors I worked with. I'm 89 years old, and you're telling me it's bedtime. <laughs> Not only that, when I came to work here, we told you it was bedtime at 7 p.m. <laughs> How many people go to bed at 7 p.m.? I, I didn't do. think so. I don't go to Not sleep. Not only that, they would turn the thermostat down to 60 degrees, so you wanted to stay there, right? Covered <laughs> up in our blankets. That's not very resident-centered. So how do we create meaning? How do we make change? No matter how long a journey or how big and impossible a change you want to make, it starts with just one step or action. This all started with me showing the staff that little silly cartoon. And we started talking about being resident centered and how we would want to live in our nursing home, our assisted living, our retirement community. Would we wanna be listened to? Would we wanna have choice um, of all those things? The kind of meals that we would want, what would they be? Activities that were inspiring where you were able to learn new things. Aging is a series of growth experiences, not a deadline. And you live that every day. I watch you all the time. And you are living an abundant life. You're learning new things every day. You experience new things, and that's what resident center care is all about. The secret of change is to focus all your energy not on fighting the old, but on, on building the new. And that's what the Texas Culture Change Coalition is all about. From the resident's perspective, I have the right to determine how best to meet my needs. It must include me, 
my family and team in decision making. My care must be empowering, nurturing, nurturing and respectful. My care should optimize my physical and psychosocial well-being. Nothing about me without me. Person-centered care is all about people living the lives they want to live in the best way they can. And when you do it right, you have overall health stability, increased quality of life and quality of care, reduction in weight loss, reduction of medications, improved social engagement, increased overall satisfaction, a more abundant life, empowerment, and joy. For the staff, empowerment and ownership, retention improvement, increased overall satisfaction, renewed passion for their work, relationship building, and joy. Did you know, and I Googled this today, is Texas the worst state quality care in nursing homes? Yes, it is. And so that's one of the reasons that I've been involved in culture change, because I want to bring what we accomplished here to the rest of the state, and I think we need it. That was eight different sources said that Texas is ranked the worst. Camille knows I asked the state, and they wouldn't tell me. <laughs> so it is, is, is Texas the worst state? Well, you know, there's a lot of different numbers out there. I just simply asked the question to Google today, and this is a response. It is an election year. <laughs> <laughs> so re always remember resident-centered directed care can impact everything in a positive way when successful. What we need to do is practice, practice self-examination. Are we really doing the best we can? Search every day for new creativity and opportunities for doing better in every way while working with the residents. Recognize that culture change and transformation are not destinations, but a journey, always a work in progress. I get in a lot of trouble around here sometimes because of all the projects. All the projects and pushing the leadership team to be better than we are today, right? To push ourselves to be better tomorrow. And a lot of the projects come about from the things that residents say to me um, and trying to make this a first class community for all of you and for all of us. Could we make the same improvements that we've made here throughout Texas? I think we can. Can resident-centered care be the difference in quality that our state needs? I think it can. A few years ago, you know, we had a lot, a lot of um, psychotropic medications that were being used in our healthcare center and assisted living. And we created some tools here um, that were non-pharmacological interventions for use with residents. And basically it's simple stuff like a resident that may be trying to exit seek, well, how about just take them for a walk? Let them walk around in the courtyard for a little bit. Um, somebody that's sundowning in the afternoon, well, let's build a successful day for them and help them take a nap in the afternoon. Um, somebody that's um, anxious, well, how about learning three positive stories about their life that you can share with them to redirect them. Residents with Alzheimer's, and this is one of the things that I think creates our desire to work so hard to support Alzheimer's research and funding. There's different <clears throat> levels of Alzheimer's, but most residents go through a period where they're constantly walking, they're wandering around in and out of residence rooms and wandering the halls and they're looking for something. They don't know what it is that they're looking for a lot of the time. Um, and they'll just walk themselves to death unless we engage them in something meaningful and sit down with them and we can talk, we can reminisce about the old days because they have their long-term memory. It's the short-term memory that's not there. So we figure out a way to do that. Um, and you don't need medications to snow people. 
So, you know, back in the day, the goal was to keep everybody quiet and still. And so they would get medication to keep them quiet and still. I remember hanging, having a conversation once with my nursing staff, and this was early on, and they were saying to me, you know, so-and-so's having hallucinations, we're gonna have to medicate him. And I said, well, what kind of hallucinations is he having? He keeps seeing children playing in his room. What does he do when he sees these hallucinations? He laughs hysterically. That doesn't sound so bad to me. I'll leave him alone. Let's just educate everybody that that's what's happening. And we did, we left him alone. And every afternoon he saw kids playing in his room, the corner of his room, and he laughed hysterically for 45 minutes. So what? It's we that needed to adjust to that, right? Not him, it worked. So as, as we created these tools here at Westminster, there was a project underway to reduce antipsychotic and psychotropic use across the state of Texas, because guess what? Who was the worst state in the union when it came to using those medications? You're right, Texas was. So we embarked on this project using the tools, some of the tools that we developed right here at Westminster. We were able to be, and we're eighth in the country right now. We made dramatic improvement. And I think that what we can do as a state is use the lessons that we've learned here at Westminster with regard to resident center care and culture change across the state of Texas. I just saw Max Sherman. You know what I'm talking about, don't you, Max? <laughs> so, um, Texas Culture Change Coalition, I'm president this year. I'm also a founding member. We started it back in 2010. And it's all about sharing this idea and the tools that we've used in presentations and various other tools with the entire state for free, right? We're doing a conference. It's um, $75. You get eight hours of CEUs. So for nurses and administrators, they're required to get so many CEUs per year. It's, it's a great deal. The money that we take in from that conference will pay for the next one. It also pays for a website with a huge bank of tools, webinars, um, that are free for any facility to use. And I'm pushing this idea in the state. At this conference, um, I'm hoping to get all of the various associations together. So the Texas Assisted Living Association, Division of Health and Senior Services, um, Leading Age, Texas Healthcare Association, um, just all of the different organizations, associations share the same narrative and the same tools and try to help our state be better than worst. That's the goal. What do you think about that? Good idea. There's another program that I think drives our quality and you guys, you all asked me about this quite a bit. Um, and that is, how do we train the staff? How do they learn hospitality and we have a program called extraordinary impressions and what we do with extraordinary impressions it's a hospitality training program and basically our vision statement there is extraordinary impressions drives high quality customer experiences for everyone Westminster serves so the Westminster serves its residents it also serves the associates it serves our vendors it serves our families through Extraordinary Impressions, we passionately and proudly differentiate ourselves. We meet and exceed the customer's expectations. We constantly demonstrate our service culture and recognize all who embody it. So that's what the star cards are about and all of the things that we do. Um, caught caring in the healthcare center. Um, our hospitality promises, we have 10 hospitality promises that we train our staff on. EI hospitality promises, our 10 specific conduct and, and uh, performance guidelines in conjunction with the hospitality vision statement. So you can see we hold ourselves and one another accountable. We listen and respond enthusiastically in a timely manner. Um, we pay attention to the details. Um, so we're polishing, so we're making polishing classes, um, trying to make sure that Westminster 
is top of the top of mind, top of class, first class. Do we do we make mistakes? Uh huh. We do. When we do, I hope that we learn a lesson from it, and we do better going forward. Many times we do. One of the most important things we train staff members to do is service recovery. That's when you walk into a situation, you can tell that something has gone wrong and you do whatever it takes to fix the problem. That's also an opportunity for what we call a magical moment. And we want to respond in such a way that you're almost glad it happened because it gave us a chance to shine, right? We are working to wow you not just satisfy you. We don't want to keep you silent. We want you to brag about how we perform service recovery. We want to act in such a way that you never regret moving into Westminster. And that's what we're all about. We don't always hit this mark, but this is what we're aiming for every day. We want to be a shining example of what senior living and long-term care can and should be and we want to make a difference in the lives of our residents, our families, and each other. And we keep winning awards doing this. I talked about the five-star rating for 14 years. That's incredible. Nobody has 14 years of five-star rating. Um, J.D. Power Award, third year in a row. Um, our experience rating, nobody cares about this but my leadership team and myself. That means that our work comp experience rating went down, meaning that we had less injuries to our staff over the last several years. Um, this year, we've only had two incidents where um, staff members have gotten hurt. That's incredible for um, a staff as large as ours. We received a 10 years deficiency free assisted living survey award. I thought phase one Windsor expansion opening on time was a big deal, and our 55th anniversary is a big deal. Deficiency free financial audit is a big deal. Deficiency free healthcare center surveys, and that's been for several years now. And US News World Report, best senior living, independent living, assisted living, and our skilled nursing. We talked about the triple B rating last time. We, we just received the five-star resident satisfaction award. And we, I talked about the silver safety award. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Anyone have any questions of Chuck? This is a good time to ask something. If it's, yes, would you stand, Betsy, for sure? I was just wondering. How many staff do we have? How many staff do we have? About 280. We're adding 70 more between now and uh, February next year. Okay, other questions? Anyone? Okay, Chuck, we are so proud of you and the staff and uh, we cannot say enough about the wonderful support that we get from all the different sections of Westminster and your leadership is just absolutely crucial. Thank you. I did forget one thing and that's a commercial break. Um, we do have one more Alzheimer's Texas event and it's kind of fun. There's supposed to be a wheel of wine there. You can win a banana a coffee mug or a bottle of wine for a buck. So everyone's a winner. Um, on October the 14th, it's 10 to 3, and it'll be right here in Harrisville Hall, and, and it's for a great cause. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you. All right. um, for my president's report, um, we have two items. Gail, if you will come on up and grab the microphone. Um, and talk to us about our resident appreciation fund. Whatever you're comfortable with. Can you hear me if I speak here? I sit down and talk. You can, hear me. can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, fine. I just want to give you a few comments about the resident appreciation fund. 
those of you who've been here for a long time are familiar with it. Others are new. We've had a lot of new people come in this year. The candy canes are up, and that's the sign that the campaign has started for the Resident Appreciation Fund. We will mark on it as we go along to reach our goal of $200,000. This is our goal. Um, the purpose of the activity is to show the 278 or so associates who serve us every day in so many different ways when you stop and think about it. Your room gets clean, the hallways are clean, uh, there are decorations put up, those who uh, come and make repairs for you, the food pre preparers and the, those who so graciously serve us. There are so many, I mentioned a few of the things the associates do for us, but there are so many others that are hidden behind the scenes that make this such a great place to live. Uh, we're asking a donation of $500 per person. If there are two people in a unit, then it would be a thousand. But when you spread this out, it actually ends up being about a dollar fifty a day. And that's a little amount for so much that they do for us. So I hope you'll think about that when you're considering your donation. Uh, at the end of the year, these funds are distributed equally to all Westminster Associates below leadership level. The donations are kept confidential and only accessed by the association treasurer. This is an activity of Westminster Residents Association and is, as such, tax deductible, and a donation letter will be provided. In the next couple of days, in your cubbies, you will get a more detailed letter explaining what this is about. Also, there will be an envelope stamped with my address if you just put your check in the envelope and they just leave it at any of the reception desk and then they will get back to me um, there are a lot of people who have helped out on this and i would like to introduce the members of my team uh, in the next day or so you will be seeing us with red and white ribbons and those will be our team members so if you have any questions or concerns please don't hesitate to contact us this time, I'd like to ask the members of the team to stand up, and uh, so I can introduce them to you. Steve Byers, Cynthia Leach, Jill Losey, Jerry Smith, Sharon Verlander, and Phyllis Waddle. I want to thank all of these who are helping so much with this. donations to those who serve us so quietly. Okay, now we're going to uh, recognize and I'll ask Boyd to come up and Lori. Um, we're going to take the remainder of our time to highlight the journal that um, is hot off the press today. And uh, we have some readings by people that have written for it. So you go to Mike. And... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Give a script, too. Yeah. We're writers, right? Okay. <laughs> so we don't do anything without a script. So, uh, uh, Lori, the 2022 <laughs> Writer's Journal is out. Uh, were you worried we wouldn't get it done? No, no. Although I'm usually the person that says, well, what if? But no, it's wonderful. All the fabulous people here, the writers and the editorial staff. Hold the microphone. It looks like your mouth. Oh, thank you. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And all the have... wonderful writers and staff. So let's meet them all. Yeah, we have 39 resident writers represented in this uh, edition. And we have the editorial board that uh, that produced this edition. So would you all stand so we can uh, you can be recognized? Everybody that wrote for the journal or worked on the journal. Our first uh, reader is Janice Sheffelman, who I think you all know. And so Janice, if you would come forward. Yeah, that would be a great idea. 
idea. We'll learn, we'll do better next time with the logistics. <laughs> Texas, where German immigrants were persecuted for being unionists in a state that had seceded from the Union. <laughs> Cabins were burned, women, men were hanged, and women were raped. Now all the able men have been forced to leave to fight on one side or the other or go into hiding. Thus, women were left at the mercy of vigilantes and hostile Indians. In the previous entry, Sophie witnessed the hanging of a Confederate deserter on her own home place. She tried in vain to save him, but they threatened her with rape. The deserter's last request was that Sophie take his body to his wife in a nearby village. So with a family friend, she calls Tante, Aunt, and Arliss, an elderly hired hand. The three made their way to his village, Sophie and Tante on horseback, Arliss driving the oxen, that pulled the wagon with the body. We came to a house where a young woman stood on the gallery like a statue, holding a baby in her arms. Marie, no doubt. All at once she came alive, ran toward us, threw open the gate, and stopped beside the wagon, staring at the wrapped body. She shook her head. You're not bringing my Sam, are you? With a wrenching in my belly, I nodded. If you are Marie, yes. Her mouth fell open and she looked at me, her eyes unbelieving. She threw back her head and screamed, no! The baby started crying and one of the <clears throat> townswomen came and took him from her arms. Marie scrambled into the wagon, screaming and weeping, no, it can't be, you Sam, it can't. She opened the wrapping at the top and gasped, oh, Sam. No. She lay down beside him, wrapped her arms around his body and wept. I put my face in my hands and wept too. This is how it is to lose a loved one. No one can do anything. No one can bring him back. He's gone forever. People around us did not move, did not speak. Women dabbed at their eyes with handkerchiefs. I dismounted and stood beside the wagon. Marie? She lifted her head, staring at me with watery eyes. Marie, I'm Sophie Gunther. I swallowed hard to get rid of the lump in my throat. Yesterday morning, I rode out to our home place near Comfort and found your husband hiding in our barn. We don't live there anymore because our house burned down. 
She climbed out of the wagon and grasped me by the shoulders, her eyes frantic. What, what, tell me what happened. He said he deserted from the Confederate Army. I warned him that Waldrop's wolf pack was looking for him in town, that he should move on for his own safety. But he was hungry and I promised to bring him something to eat. Marie began to slowly shake her head as if to deny what I was about to say. When I returned, a band of vigilantes was, was preparing to hang him. I pleaded with them to stop, but they threatened me. His last request was that I tell you he loved you and the baby. Her face twisted with pain and tears streamed down, streamed down her cheeks. He shouldn't have deserted, but he, I, he wanted to see his son. In his last letter, Sam said he was afraid he would be killed without ever laying eyes on him. Marie again shook her head in disbelief. I had a husband, and now I don't. I felt a pang in my chest as the awful finality of her words echoed in the air. I had a husband, and now I don't. Now I don't. Nothing could ever bring him back. What if this were Papa or Edward? Elements. They're available in earlier editions of the of the Writer's Journal, and I encourage you to read, read all of them. It's, it's amazing work. Uh, I should say that we have three sections of uh, three genres in the Writer's Journal. We have fiction, which you just heard a representation, a representative uh, piece from. We have poetry, and we have nonfiction, which includes uh, memoirs and other articles. So. Uh, poetry is a very important part of Westminster's life. There's, we have a lot of very talented poets, and one of them is going to read a selection from her, her a piece out of the Writer's Journal now, Bonita Prince. to read from his uh, nonfiction piece, it's, and uh, 
in his absence, uh, he's unable, unable to be here today. Well, Lori's going to read a, a bit from that uh, that piece. Does this work? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, this is a piece called Dinner at All Souls. In 1990, Guy and his wife Dory went to Oxford, England to spend 10 months at uh, the College of All Souls. And it's a uh, graduate research college. And I think he said that Princeton University has a very similar kind of setup, an imitation. Of uh, the British. I don't know if I can do justice to this. It's a wonderful piece, and I know that Guy's inimitable, wonderful sense of humor would have read it so much better. But at any rate, dinner at All Souls. I eat evening meals in the college two or three times a week. For these occasions, we all wear suits and academic gowns on weekdays, or a black tie, and he means tuxedos, plus academic gowns on weekends. After being greeted by the head steward at 7.15 p.m. in front of a massive old oak door, which is opened by a key the size of your right femur, we are ushered into a magnificent, dimly lit, 16th century great hall, festooned with large portraits of past and present great fellows. We are seated at a long and splendid 18th century table, replete with silver tankards, candelabra, flatware, and lemon, linen napkins. After a formal Latin prayer by the warden, that's the president of all souls, or the sub-warden, the vice president, I presume, or the senior fellow eating in college, dinner served by a covey of doting butlers. No female servers in evidence. <laughs> At each place is a printed menu in French, embossed with a mallard duck, the emblem of the college. Not kidding. a scrumptious three-course meal accompanied by good, sometimes superb, wine from the college's wine cellar, which stretches under half the college. <laughs> Following these exquisite courses, a final Latin prayer terminates the meal. But wait, the dinner is not yet over. And you can read about the dinner just get your journal. I'm not a blind and clumsy. Uh, so, Lori. Uh, We've encouraged you, I hope, to buy a journal. Uh, and uh, I think the last thing for us to tell you, well, two things. One, how do you get one? They're on the table back at the back. Uh, there's a table beside it where you can sign your name and give us your apartment number. That's all that's required. You pick up your journal, sign your name, walk out with uh, a compilation of the works of all these 39 writers, which I'm sure you will enjoy very much. Uh, we don't take cash, we don't want cash, we don't want, we don't need credit cards, we don't need those little three numbers on the back of it. Uh, <laughs> we'll just charge it to your Westminster account. Uh, so nothing could be simpler. Uh, we thank you for your attention and uh, all, for all of the editorial board who have uh, worked uh, to make this, this year's edition possible. I wanna tell you that, it's, that we've enjoyed it. We've enjoyed doing it. And we hope that you will enjoy it as much. So have a glass of wine when Camille lets you and uh, have some refreshments and talk to the writers and then uh, buy a book.
Thank you very much. I think the, um, the agenda today was all about celebration, and don't we have a lot to celebrate? Let's, let's celebrate, let's clap. And I want to uh, ask all of our executive committee members to stand um, so that you see who they are. All of you all, please stand. of nominees for class two and Pat Wright is the chair if you would stand. Uh, Emily Ashworth, I think her husband is ill. Um, okay, Fred Hansen. I thought I saw Fred a while ago. Where's Fred? Okay. Um, Bill Schlees and Carol Sykes and Jim Woodrick. Let's give them a round of applause. Okay, now it's time. If you want a, a, a writer's journal, they're set up in the back for you to be able to purchase one. All you do is sign your life away for paying for it. No money is taken, no credit cards. It's designed to be a very simple process. Well, what's the price? I put you in a price. Oh, what's the price, boy? Fifteen dollars. Thank you for that question. And it includes a tax, he says. Okay. Is there any other business to become before this residence association meeting? Hearing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? Linda, what's your last name? Blue Cats. Okay. Um, Pat seconds. Pat. Pat seconds. All in favor say aye. Aye. You are adjourned to enjoy both the journal but also some wonderful food and beverage and each other. Have a great day.